Okay, hey, I'm Felix Domke. I'm doing a talk on JTAC black box reverse engineering today. Um, this is a hardware talk. I hope you are not scared away. It looks like, well, the room is more empty than before, but anyway, I appreciate your listening to me. So, um, JTIC is a topic I worked in my spare time for the last few years and I finally want to present my findings about what you can do, what you may not have known before. So, the alternative t title is The Secret of JTEC. Um, so, yeah, this is a hardware talk, but you should listen anyway, because even if you're a user of some, some hardware which you think that is secure, you might be interested that a hacker could use JTAG to hack into this device. And you might not even know that this device has JTAG. So, even, or even if you're a hardware developer, you probably know that there's a JTAG port on the device, but you might not know what exactly you could do with it beyond of what the, the manufacturer tells you to do. So, this talk, yeah, tries to make you aware of what JTAG actually means to you and to security in your hardware. And this is not, what is this not? So this is not a talk on how to revive your bricked hardware using JTAG. There are pretty good resources on that and like there are other talks I think from previous um, C3s and there are also online resources. So this is not a talk about how to use some existing software to reflash your router or something. When I tell people that I'm working on JTAG, they always ask me the question like, can I use my Wiggler JTAG interface for doing JTAG stuff? And the question is pretty much like, can I use a PC for doing development? The answer is of course, but you have to know what you're doing. So in the end, you probably have to solder your own JTAG interface, but it's not hard. The physical layer of JTAG is really simple. It's really just a few wires you need to attach to some GPIO pins and then the rest is software for you. I'm a software person, so I always enjoy if I can do everything in software and don't have to solder that much because I suck at soldering, so. Yeah, so let's start. This is part one, the three types of developers. Um, as I said, I'm a software developer, so this is pretty much my workflow when I do some software development. If I want to write a program, I think about the design a bit, I think about the design a bit more, and then I start implementing it, like hacking some code together, and finally I, I compile it and I run it, and if it runs, I, it's fine, and I will deploy the code, and if it doesn't run, well, I spend some time debugging the issues and finding out what's wrong, changing that in my code and recompiling it, and then try it again, right? And this, this whole, steps take like, yeah, depending on your project size, several seconds or several minutes, maybe more, maybe less. So it's really a matter of, of a coffee or something. <coughs> and the way people do debugging in software project is that hopefully they start with the unit tests so they know that parts of the software is already working and they have their test sets and so on then they are probably adding a lot of debug code like optional debug traces and a lot of debug printf. Printf is actually a pretty popular way to debug programs and well, I mean it works great, right? Some people use debuggers and enjoy like messing around with the state of the program while it's executing or observing memory while it's executing. There are lots of ways to debug software, I think all of you know that. The problem is that the debug code that is added into a program affects performance and the code size. Like if you ever compiled a, a huge project with symbol information, you know that it can be 10 times as big and even bigger. So before deploying, you have to or you should remove the debug code and build a release build of your software. Like you remove all the debug code you added and you remove symbols from the build process. And then you just hope that it still works after you change the program to not be a debug version anymore. And usually this works fine. I mean. That's what, what we're usually doing so. And another type of developer is a hardware developer. So, I mean, a, a lot of us probably already developed hardware, but I'm not so much a hardware programmer, so this is how I think a hardware developer, yeah, implements his stuff. So, first, again, you should think about what you actually want to build, and the design stage might be a bit more extensive than for a software project, depending on the size, of course. Then you start implementing like drawing schematics and routing the PCB and if you're happy with it and you might run some simulations but 
you could also just send it to some, some manufacturing company and they will build a prototype batch of, of PCBs and you get embedded. It, depending on the project, it costs maybe a few thousand dollars depending on how many components you have, how complicated the, the setup process is, how many layers your PCB has and so on. But it usually takes a few weeks until you get back prototype boards. And then you get those prototype boards, switch them on, hope that there's no smoke, and then you will do some measure measurements like checking if everything, if the voltages are okay, and then you try like doing simple stuff with it, like trying it to boot simple code. And well, you will debug the board and you will either find that it works as you think it should work, and then you can ship it, or you find some bugs, and you will again f try to understand the bugs and change that in the implementation, like fix the schematics or fix the routing or the, the, pla the, the, the uh, placement or whatever, and then you do another run, which costs another few thousand dollars. It is pretty much okay if you don't need that many revisions of hardware. So hardware developers add debug stuff too, like they add test ports on their devices. To, because measuring signals can be pretty hard if all of them are BGA, type devices, so you want to route some, some signals you're interested into dedicated test ports so you can easily attach your scope or logic analyzer to them. And sometimes you have like different options how to configure something, like you could have, you could have two different power regulators on it, like a linear regulator and a step down, and you could choose between those by populating different parts, so if you think your problem is in the, in the actual power supply, you could try different combinations. And I mean, the, the, the good thing about this is if you deploy your product and it fe fails in the field, you can get it back and repopulate the, the test headers. So you don't even need to populate the test headers when shipping a project uh, or a product. So that makes it pretty cheap to add test ports. That requires a bit of PCB space, but that's it. So the, the advantage is you can still debug units you got back when they fail is often an enough that, you, that hardware designers don't bother in removing all of the debug features and they are not doing a separate re retail build. They, so usually the revision you get in the store is pretty much the same that has been used for like the last few design stages. There's no separate um, non-debug version of a board usually. Now, a third type of developer, it gets more and more hardcore, is a silicon developer. I mean, I w I'm not a silicon developer, so again, this is just how I think silicon developers do their work. They spend a lot of time on the design phase, uh, really, uh, like a year or more. Then they start implementing the, the code, like the, the HDL code or something. They develop a lot, of, they do a lot of s simulations, and when they're finally happy with what they have, they send it to the fab, and they will like build masks and produce some silicon and you get back the silicon and then it hopefully works, right? Because the whole test run costs easily a million dollars or more and it takes easily a few months or more. So it's not something you can do just again because you had a stupid error in it. That's why silicon developers do a lot with simulation. They can simulate almost everything. Like if they're designing a CPU, they can probably boot a whole operating system in their simulator. It will take ages, but they can simulate that it will work. And surprisingly often, the final product w works in the same way as the simulation. So the simulation tools are pretty good. It's far better than like what l probably what hardware developers have like PCB developers because they, they can never emulate enough of their system that, it, that the result is accurate enough. But for silicon developers, because the turnaround is so expensive and takes so much time, people spend a lot of energy to improve simulation. And the, the largest part of silicon development is actually doing the design validation and the developing test sets and all of that. And only a small part is the actual functional implementation. Still, silicon developers add debug functionality, like they add debug switches where they can, like, they have a register and you can disable certain parts of the chip because you want to try without those and see if, the, if an error you have is still present there. They also add a lot of what software developers have printf for, they add a lot of debug 